Here's one called Sandy River Bell. <laughs> Blacksmith makes his fire from coal. He heats the iron up in the fire, brings it to the anvil, and with the hammer, forges it to shape. The work of the blacksmith is iron forging. So he uses the forge, the anvil, and the hammer to shape his work. Uh, they were in their day, they were the, uh, you know, they were, they were practicing the, the high technologies of the day, if you will. Uh, forming metal, metallurgy. Blacksmiths were also known as the king, kings of the craftsmen. They made the tools that the other craftsmen used. Uh, carpenters, uh, furniture makers, stone masons. You know, blacksmiths would make the tools, the hammers, the chisels. Uh, that sort of thing, the tooling that these other craftsmen uh, used in their craft. Well, it's important to preserve the craft. It's an ancient craft, as I said. And uh, even modern day uh, work uh, is important because a lot of people want hand work done the old way. So there's still there's still a need for uh, the craft of, of iron forging. actually what we call a rag rug. It's made out of uh, cloth strips from old skirts and blouses and shirts and blankets and curtains and things that we have gotten too far gone to repair. We will tear it up into strips about one inch, one and a half inches and uh, just weave it through this loom. And this loom is called a friendly loom because I can actually pick it up and take it with me wherever I choose to do this. If I want to sit under a shade tree, which I, I've done up here, I can just pick it up and carry it with me. I go to a different house, uh, just put it anywhere I want it to go. We have another large loom that takes up half the room of one of the other houses, and uh, you definitely can't move it around. So I particularly like working with this one. I always get to these corners and I get messed up. Uh, these looms are real easy to make. Uh, I think somebody made this one up here. And it's just a very old craft that's been passed down, kind of a waste not, want not philosophy. Everybody did this that had old rug scraps, I mean old clothes scraps, so that they wouldn't waste anything. <laughs> today just kind of take it for granted some of the things that we have like clothing rugs quilts and bedspreads and things like that uh, if they actually knew that their grandmother or great-grandmother put in hours and hours and could actually make the things that they just take for granted that they can go down to Walmart and buy for 20 bucks their grandmother probably sat down with a loom or some sort of skill she learned from her mother and her mother before that um, it, people just have a big wow factor when they hear that, that that can be handmade or you can make that. It's like, yeah, you can. You just need to pass down the know-how from generation to generation and take time. Um, they didn't have as many modern conveniences. They didn't have as, as hectic a lifestyle. So they, they were a little more laid back in some of the things they did. They just didn't work real hard all day long. They would sit down, take a few hours to 
safety stress from say working in the fields or working with a crying baby and do things like this like quilting, uh, crocheting, knitting, weaving. Uh, women had to get away from it all too and this is kind of how they did it. They didn't have spas and saunas. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how you kind of de-stress and actually still be productive at the same time. historical interpreter. That means I interpret history as we present it here on the mountain. Um, 19th century farm life from the early 1800s all the way to the turn of the century. And um, I might demonstrate different handcrafts uh, that people what we call handcrafts now. These were all necessities that people uh, did to produce the items they needed in their everyday life, such as thread, so that they could weave pieces of fabric into clothing. Well, so many of these skills are dying out, and by learning them, it keeps them from disappearing. There's few people that still do them, and more and more people come to it and discover these crafts, these trades. So, as long as there are a few people capable of doing this. We won't forget. Also reminds us of how basic and simple life was at one time, just to get by. And now everything is so easily manufactured for us. We take everything so for granted. Mm -hmm. Then people had to uh, make their own music. Yes. Well, I played rock and roll music in my youth, and when I got older, I got interested in my roots, having uh, been born and grown up in the mountains of West Virginia and Virginia, and now Huntsville, Alabama. So, uh, we started listening to old recordings of this music that were made in the late 1920s and early 30s and seeking out older musicians that were still around playing this kind of music. And we went to festivals and just had a big time. We met a lot of nice people, so that's how we got into it. Well, uh, the best thing is the camaraderie amongst musicians when they get together and jam. Uh, you have a band, sometimes that's kind of like work. <laughs> but <clears throat> when you can just relax and um, play with your friends and talk about uh, things, that, that's really the most fun for us, as you say, dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, we met some uh, real characters along the way. Yeah. I was lucky enough to uh, meet some of the old timers before they passed on. People like the famous fiddler Tommy Gerald, uh, 
uh, Huntsville's Monte Sano Crowder was a good friend of ours for about 20 years. He held a dance here in Huntsville for 32 years called the Snuff Dippers Ball. Wow. He passed away a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and we miss him. We're going to play a tune called Great Eagle. 